go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chandra Cullen. I'm the Vice Chair of the Child Psychiatry Division here at UNM, and I'm really pleased to introduce um, today's speaker, Sarah Winger, to talk about just a, a wonderful program here at UNM called CareLink. Um, so Sarah is the Director of CareLink Services at UNMH and oversees the adult and pediatric CareLink te teams, as well as the Connect program. Um, Sarah is a native Southwesterner. She spent her childhood in Santa Fe before attending the New, Milita New Mexico Military Institute in Roswell for, her, for high school. Sarah studied psychology and human resource management at Northern Arizona University, then went on to earn her master's degree in counseling from Adler Graduate School in Minnesota. Since Sarah has returned to the land of enchantment in 2012, she has dedicated her career to improving the access, availability, and quality of mental health services in the community. Sarah is a licensed professional clinical counselor and will graduate this December from UNM with a master's in health administrative degree. So thank you so much for being here today, Sarah, and I will let you go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Cullen, and thanks for the invitation to present here. I'm very excited to talk about CareLink, and um, I've, I've been with UNMH for about nine years, and I've been in this role for about four years, and this is by far my favorite type of work. So I'm super excited to share with everybody the great work that, that my team does and um, help to educate everyone on CareLink resources and um, some of our workforce development strategies, um, just to speak to the expansion that we've um, that we've uh, undergone in the last four years. So I will start to share my screen here. All right, are you able to see that? Okay, great. So uh, for today, we'll spend a little bit of time just talking about the history of, of CareLink um, in New Mexico. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the services that CareLink provides and our uh, community engagement. Um, then we'll take a look at uh, the membership demographics, so specifically the types of people in our community that we're serving. Um, then I'd like to review the eligibility and referral process for our program, and uh, then talk a little bit about employee engagement and workforce uh, development um, before we look ahead to 2023, which will be here before we know it. So um, CareLink Behavioral Health Homes um, were established by the state of New Mexico as part of the Centennial Care iteration in 2014. And so something that's not known to a lot of folks and particularly to a lot of folks on Medicaid is that the Affordable Care Act um, included care coordination services to all individuals enrolled into Medicaid. Uh, through the development and the implementation of this behavioral health home model, um, members now have a choice between um, receiving their care coordination services through the MCO or choosing to go to a delegated uh, provider agency like us here at UNM um, to deliver the, the care coordination services. And so the behavioral health home model really helps to target individuals with a mental health diagnosis, specifically with severe mental illness, uh, severe emotional disturbance, or with a substance use disorder. And so um, to implement this behavioral health home model, 12 care links were established throughout the state of New Mexico. And so um, as you can see here, uh, Bernalillo County has two CareLink Behavioral Health Homes, um, us here at UNMH, and then uh, New Mexico Solutions is also a CareLink. Um, and then we see some of the familiar uh, community mental health uh, provider agencies uh, serving some of our more rural parts of the state. Um, Sandoval County, which, which includes Rio Rancho and Berlin, has, has PMS. Um, PMS also serves the Farmington area up in San Juan County. And then you'll see Mental Health Resource Center and uh, Hildago Medical Services, and then the um, guidance center of, of the county as well. So as the Caroline Behavioral Health Homes were, were implemented, uh, we were tasked with achieving the following five goals. Um, so we really worked to promote, promote uh, coordinated care for acute health conditions and improve long-term health. We really want to reduce and prevent risk behaviors amongst our member population. We really want to increase member engagement and self-efficacy and overall just improve the quality of life for the individuals that we serve here in our community. Um, and then, of course, we want to reduce avoidable utilization of emergency departments and inpatient and residential services. So in 2018, CareLink here at UNMH was, uh, was established, and there were two different programs that were developed. Um, the UPC CareLink uh, program serves the adult population, and then the CPC CareLink uh, program serves the pediatric and transitional age youth programs. 
Um, I stepped into a role as director in February of, of 19, uh, 2019 and oversaw the CPC CareLink um, area. And then in February, February of this year, uh, began to, to oversee both, uh, both CareLink programs. So overall, we're a team of uh, nearly 60 employees. Um, we have 44 care coordinators, which is really a wonderful thing. Uh, we have certified uh, peer support workers. We have community liaisons, health promotion coordinators. We have an incredible registration and billing team. And then our leadership in, uh, leadership team. Um, and um, we're, we're also very grateful to have uh, Dr. Jaswell as our, as our medical director. So we are a community-based program. And so that means that a majority of our work is completed out in the community with our members. Um, we did have to push pause a little bit on this for the uh, COVID pandemic, but we have uh, started to slowly return to um, that field work or, or uh, community-based work. And we expect to see that increase even, even more so in the next coming months. So overall, we really work to link the members in our program to any type of service that they need. So although all of the members in our program have a mental health diagnosis, we will connect them to any type of service. And so um, we will, of course, link members to, to mental health services, both within the UNM system and just out in the community. Um, we'll also help to link members to medical providers. Um, we will help with dental and vision um, services and and then um, multiple community community resources. Um, we provide individual and family support, and then we monitor the healthcare utilization, um, and then also offer some health promotion and community engagement activities as well. Um, overall, we really, really want to work to engage in, and empower our members, um, our, our members and the, the members of our community. Um, overall, our mission is to really help our, our people access community and the people of our community access healthcare appropriately and participate in, in their health. Um, we really want to help them to, to, live, to live meaningful lives. So um, when, a, when a member chooses, a Medicaid member chooses to opt into the CareLink program, they're assigned a care coordinator. Um, the care coordinator will meet with the member or their guardian um, to complete a comprehensive needs assessment. So if you're ever looking in Cerner, this is, this is uh, found in the form of the VH wellness visit form. Um, and this VH wellness visit form includes a great amount of, of information about, about our members. So we take a look at uh, medical history, family history, psychiatric history. We do some social determinants of health screenings, uh, mental health screenings. Um, we really get this in-depth uh, amount of information um, on, on our member to help them kind of decide what they need and want help with. Um, and completing that, that CNA or that comprehensive needs assessment really helps to start the uh, helping relationship between the care coordinator and the member. So after the care court or the uh, comprehensive needs assessment is completed, um, we do create a care plan goal. Um, we create both um, long-term and short-term goals to, re to meet with, with the member. And then we'll um, work with our members as much or as little as is needed to support the progress towards those care plan goals. And so since we are a care coordination service, we're not considered a level of care. And this really allows the members that enroll into our program to, to stay in our program for very long periods of time. Um, as we're, we've been around for about four years now, we're really getting to see um, members that have been with us for that long and that continue to set and reach, and reach their goals. Um, this is very helpful because um, other fee-for-service types of um, levels of care um, really, really work to support, support patients, but when their goals are met or when things are going well, um, they're, they're then discharged from the program. And so if life shifts or if things start to happen again, um, the person has to go back to the bottom of a wait list or has to, um, has to restart a relationship with the provider um, to, to access services. With us as a care coordinator, we're able to keep and engage members um, in, in our program for very long periods of time. Um, so some example of, of the CareLink services that we that we provide, um, again, we'll link members to any types of services that they need, um, but we'll also work hard to be on the preventative end of things. So if we can help to um, if we can help to link members to health screenings, to STI testing, Hep C testing, mammograms, or if we can help members attend immunizations or shot clinics, um, we really want to, to work on, on that end as well. Um, 
the community resources that we get to, to offer our, our patients or that we link our patients to um, rather are really are really quite amazing. I think we've got some really neat stories about some of our care coordinators connecting people um, to many different um, types of, of services. And so um, we'll, looking ahead to the holidays here, look to link members to toy drives and holiday meal drives. Um, we've got a connection to a business here in town that's offering uh, grocery store gift cards to help um, to help um, individuals uh, fund holiday meals for Thanksgiving. And so we'll, we'll be very excited to help to connect our members to some of those uh, types of services as well. Um, like I mentioned before, we'll link members to dental uh, visits, we'll help to arrange personal care services and nursing levels of care services in, in collaboration with the MCO. Um, we really want to ensure primary care services for our members, so we'll help to connect our members to PCPs or pediatricians for well-child checks. Um, really, it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of amazing to see the work that our care coordinators do every day and the types of, the types of things that they help to connect our, our people to. So um, through, uh, through the, the uh, Caroline Behavioral Health Home Model, um, peer support services um, are included. And so um, we've implemented peer support services over the last couple of years here. And um, really through a recovery and resiliency model, our, our certified peer support workers work in the community with our members on some of the domains that are, that are listed here. Um, it's really been neat. We, we have a, a youth peer support worker and then a, a peer certified peer support worker that, that serves adults. Um, but they're out in the community helping to, to connect people, helping to escort them to AA meetings. Um, we have a, a member that's interested in taking classes at CNM and the peer support worker is able to help take him over to campus and tour him around um, just to decrease some of the anxiety that can go with, with enrolling into a, a community college. Um, our youth peer support workers working with a 19 year old um, that is a fantastic artist and they've been going to the uh, off center art space to make use of some of the free art supplies that that are there and it's really helped to to show this young lady a, a, a neat uh, opportunity and outlet for um, for, uh, for for coping and it's really great she's been really happy to be out to be in, in community. So we also have a health promotion coordinator. Um, we have this uh, position on the children's psychiatric side, on the child side of, of CareLink. Um, and so the, the current classes and groups that we're, that we're offering are more targeted for youth and young adults, um, but we will look forward to offering a health promotion uh, coordinator position for the adult team here um, in 2023. Um, but we do offer different types of classes. We have uh, coping skills classes, we have psychoeducation classes, support groups. Um, we do have a handful of care coordinators um, that are trained in teen mental health first aid. And so we're able to, uh, to teach that curriculum directly to um, some of the, the young people in, in our community and, and hope to be expanding that here in 2023. Um, this is just a sample of some of the health promotion groups that we've offered um, last month and that are that are going on now this month. Um, we did have to have to put some of the health promotion activities on hold uh, throughout the pandemic, but we're very excited to be um, to be bringing these back to life, both in person and on Zoom. Um, some of the in-person groups are happening at the new Lamberton building, um, but we've got a health promotion coordinator that's, that's trained in the nurtured heart parenting approach, and so she's integrating some of that platform um, into some um, parenting support and, and parenting uh, skills classes, and then we've also got some, some meditation and some art groups uh, here that are happening here in November. So we really try to focus on our transitional age youth and, and in looking at our enrollment uh, demographics, it's really interesting to see the number of young people that we have between the ages of 18 and 24. And so um, we have really focused on that on the, on the CPC side of, of CareLink services. Um, and so any youth that are enrolled uh, before their 18th birthday, or if they're referred to us from a youth serving agency, um, we will enroll them into the CPC CareLink side, um, and then we'll stay with them through that transition into, into adulthood. And so, um, of course, this is a time when um, 
when all of the other providers are shifting as, as, as these uh, young adults are moving from the pediatric into adult world. So we'll stay with them and help to bridge some of that gap and then, um, and then really work to continue to provide health promotion groups that are, that are geared towards, towards this age group. So uh, through our um, through our work um, with the um, managed care organizations, we do link strongly with uh, the Medicaid um, um, agencies here in here in the state. And so uh, through Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Presbyterian, and Western Sky, we have a liaison set up at each of the MCOs. And so um, this direct line to the MCO has really been has really been helpful. Um, we're able to work closely with those liaisons to um, to really untangle issues related to eligibility or benefits or services, and um, our care coordinators are, are able to, to uh, work with them quite frequently as things come up, especially for some more um, complex types of members or when, um, or when um, things escalate, maybe a member approaches crisis. Um, our care coordinators will meet with um, the community, or I'm sorry, the CareLink liaisons uh, quarterly, and then our, our CareLink leadership team will meet will meet monthly, which with the with the uh, MCO liaisons. Um, there is a lot of value added benefits that are available through each MCO, and so through the use of our our liaison, we're able to inform and educate our members about those different types of benefits. I think, uh, for instance, Western Sky has um, like a, a prepaid seventy five dollar Visa card that's available to members, and so we're able to to let members know about those benefits and then help them get connected to that. So that's really been been a wonderful collaboration. Um, and then healthcare utilization, we really work to monitor the the um, use of of healthcare by our members, and we get to do so through um, particularly two two systems. Um, the first one here is Collective Medical. And that's an, uh, an encounter notification system that you may have seen uh, sometimes called the Eddie Alert. But um, our program is set up so that any of our members that um, go to an emergency department or get admitted to a hospital in, I think, about 37 different states, our care coordinator will get a notification from this collective medical system saying that your person has been screened at this emergency department. We'll get information on their latest contact information. We'll get uh, their chief complaint, and then we'll get discharge information. And so this really allows our care coordinators to kind of swoop in at the right time and help to support the help to support the member, help to support transitions between different levels of care, and, and then hopefully. Um, uh, able to, to help the member transition back into the community. Um, this system has been really great for helping us track down some of our more difficult to reach members. And so, um, as you know, sometimes uh, some of the people that we work with in our community don't have consistent or reliable access to, to telephones or to cell phones. And so um, sometimes they disappear for a little while. And so uh, with this collective medical system, we are able to help to get in touch and help to re-engage them um, into, into services. Um, as the collective medical system is evolving, we're also hoping to evolve the way that we use it. And so we are looking to provide more targeted intervention for high utilizers of hospital services. And this is something that we'll, that we'll work on in, in 2023. Um, the next healthcare utilization system that, that we use on a regular basis is PRISM, and that's a claim registry. And so through PRISM, we're able to view our members' uh, healthcare service claims. And so again, this is very helpful for us just to kind of paint uh, an accurate and reliable picture about the services that a member may or may not be engaging in. And this does help us to get a sense of, um, of the, the healthcare services that our members are utilizing. So we have been very active in community engagement and formed a lot of really wonderful partnerships throughout the community and uh, throughout the UNM, UNMH as well. Um, we have, uh, through these partnerships, been able to not only be a referral source for them, but also um, they become a referral source for us. So it's really nice to be able to have that two-way street. And so um, the Albuquerque Community Safety Team um, is able to offer our service when they go out and respond to, to calls in the community. And then we're also able to kind of leverage their mobility and, and, and they've assisted and supported us with, um, with wellness checks or with, with um, kind of some of those down and out types of calls. Um, we work with other community-based mental health centers here in town, the Albuquerque Housing Authority, 
Um, we've got a great partnership with uh, children, youth, and families, especially with the CBHCs, the community-based health clinicians. Um, we've been really working to kind of target the, the youth that are in the uh, child protection system. And so um, it's really been great that we can be a consistent person in, um, in a youth's life that may be in, um, in child protection custody. Um, we've worked with Albuquerque Public Schools, both their social workers and then the Title I um, Homeless Project. Um, we are working to refer people to the um, to uh, the Hep C, or we're working to support the Hep C Elimination Project here in town, working to um, send people over to Truman for Hep C screening and, and detection and treatment. Um, we've also done some presentations with the Albuquerque uh, Police Department, their crisis intervention team. And again, they've been, been able to be a referral source for us. And then we have partnered with, with some of the private counseling agencies here in town. So while we do always want to try to connect um, our members to UNM services, as we all know, I think the, the supply is kind of a lot less than the demand. And so um, if we, if, when we do have to, we, we do help to refer and get, and get uh, some of our members connected to counseling agencies outside of the UNM system. Um, we've also got some, some um, great internal partnerships with ASAP and the Truman Clinic. Uh, the Healthy and Fit Clinic has been a great referral source for us as well. Um, we are in the primary care clinics. Um, we've been working closely, especially the last six to nine months, uh, with the community engagement team through the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office here at UNMH. Um, we've partnered closely with the school-based health clinics, um, YCHD, and then, of course, uh, the UPC and CPC in both the acute and, and outpatient areas. So we do try to have a presence in the community. Um, I think some of these were taken before the, uh, before the pandemic, but we did have a booth at Civic Plaza for Mental Health Awareness Day. Um, we had a presence at the NAMI Walk. Um, at La Fiesta Park. And then these other pictures are, uh, I think, from Manzano High School and then um, Albuquerque High, where we like to just give out information about our program and really especially help to empower uh, young people to participate in our services. And really, um, it's been neat. It's been neat to, to watch them grow. I think each um, the last couple of, of summers that have started to roll around and we get a list of some of the, some of the, the members in our program that are graduating from high school. And it's it's just really been amazing, uh, amazing to be a part of. So we'll take a closer look here at uh, some of the demographics and the membership of our program. So um, again, we partner closely with each of the managed care organizations. Um, a majority um, of our members from uh, both the CPC and the UPC teams are from Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I think this certainly fits with what we see in other areas of the hospital. Um, we've then got, got Presbyterian and Western Sky as well. Um, just to take a look, um, unfortunately we don't have a way to track, but we will we will work on this. But um, we were only uh, tracking um, male and male and female when, when it comes to gender. So I would like to take a closer look and drill that down to, to identify any um, transgender non-binary um, members that we might be serving as well. Uh, but for now, we've got data on uh, gender assigned at birth. And kind of interesting to note that in the on the child program or the pediatric program, we've, we've got more, more males and females enrolled and then kind of opposite uh, when it comes to the, to the CPC or the adult uh, care link program. Um, when we take a look at age group here, it's really interesting to notice that we've got over 500 um, members that are that are between those ages of like 18 to, to 25. And so really thinking about a third of our membership enrollment is that transitional age. And so um, this is very helpful for us just as we look ahead to the future, just as we look at um, at, at training and uh, specialization for our staff, but also as some of our, our program development here. Taking a look at the top five diagnosis that, that we have, um, we do have um, on, the, on the child side of, of the program, we do see major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, PTSD, autism spectrum disorder and, and ADHD combined type um, as a top five diagnosis that we serve. Um, and, and then looking at the UPC CareLink uh, membership um, diagnosis, primary diagnosis, a lot of, a lot of, of psychosis or uh, uh, psychotic 
uh, spectrum disorders. So again, I think this can be very helpful as we think about training and, um, and workforce development for, for the people in the care coordinator roles. Um, so just to review the eligibility criteria for our program, um, we are available to any Medicaid member that's living in or around Bernalillo County. Um, we do, it, it is required that, um, that the, uh, that the member have a mental health diagnosis, um, or if they're experiencing the symptoms, they can be referred into our program and then we'll help to secure an evaluation for them to get that diagnosis. Um, if Medicaid has lapsed or if the individual is a minor and they're not enrolled in Medicaid, we will certainly help them to, to get enrolled. I think this is an area that we really want to work to spend a little bit more time in, but really making sure that people have coverage if they're eligible. And so um, we do have the, the bandwidth to help to support, um, especially when it comes to minors, but helping them to, to get enrolled in, and have uh, Medicaid benefits. So there is a way to kind of check and see if the patient is already enrolled in, in Medicaid. Um, we have worked to create a sticky note in Cerner just as a way to flag them. So if you do have a patient that, that you're thinking about for, for CareLink, I would encourage you to check out the sticky notes if they're already enrolled into our program. Um, you should be able to see the care coordinator's name, their work cell phone, their email address, and then our office um, phone number. And you're welcome to contact them through any, any way that you'd like, uh, Tiger Connect, you can you can text them, email them, power chart message. Um, but really, if you see that that a, that a patient is enrolled into our service, and there are some ways that we can help to support the work that, that you're doing with the patient, we absolutely want to know about that. So um, check to see if they're already enrolled in our program. If they're not, you're welcome to educate and offer. And so just kind of let them know about the CureLink program. Um, do take mention though, or, or make mention that if they are working with the care coordinator from their MCO and they choose to enroll into our program, um, that relationship with their MCO care coordinator will, will end if they choose to enroll into CareLink. So we just want to be mindful of that. Um, if you would like to refer a member to us, you're welcome to send a power chart message. Um, our, our billing pool address is up there and also got it at the end of the presentation as well. We've got email addresses, fax, um, and then our, our office phone number. Um, and really, even if after the fact, even if you're meeting with a patient and after they leave your office there, you think, oh, they would be a great referral for CareLink, you're welcome to, to just send their name our way. We can call out to them and explain our program and try to opt them in over the program or opt them in over the, over the phone as well. Um, we really want to be a... a a, a service that's that's got low barriers for for both providers and for for our members to access. So, um, over the last four years, we've we've grown tremendously, and so I thought it would be um, nice to spend a little bit of time talking about employee engagement and, and workforce development. And so, um, as I mentioned before, this program was started in July of 2018, and we started with one director, uh, five care coordinators one billing clerk, um, zero members and no, no office space. And so here we are today in November of, of 2022, um, we have 60 team members and we have almost 2000 members enrolled. Um, on the CPC CareLink side of things, we've got three supervisors and 21 care coordinators. We have a youth peer support worker, a health promotion coordinator, and a community liaison. And then we've been able to, to enroll and serve 904 pediatric and transitional age uh, members in, in our community, which is which is really amazing. Um, on the UPC side of things, we've got three supervisors, 23 care coordinators, a peer support worker, a community liaison, and over 1,000 uh, members, members enrolled. And so um, combined, we have a director, a clinical manager, registration and billing team. We've got our medical director, and we've got some office space. Uh, we're located in, um, in Medical Arts Plaza. So um, the CPC uh, CareLink team, um, has been very fortunate and, and been quite, um, quite effective with, um, with the hiring, training, and retention of, of staff. And so we've really tried to have a strong focus of, of training and onboarding. Um, we've got ongoing um, training, which includes clinical and non-clinical topics. Um, we've really tried to emphasize a professional quality of life and a work-life balance amongst our team. And we really, really try to, to maintain a supportive strength-based uh, culture here. So the care coordinator role is a bachelor's level position and, it, and it's neat to think of us having 44 care coordinators. Um, 
we've we've got um, we've got, and this is something that I just feel so proud of. But we have about thirty two percent of our staff enrolled in a university degree program, and so I just really am am thrilled that this will be the next generation of of social workers or of cl clinicians in our in our community. I think this care coordinator role is is very excellent for building capacity for clinical social work or a counseling career. Um, it's really my hope that we can help set into the community um, just batches of, of skilled and sharp clinicians with very strong case management skills. Um, and, and, and I think this, this role is really perfect for helping um, people that may be young in their, in their counseling career to just have exposure to working with multiple diagnosis, multiple age groups. And, um, and it's, really been, it's really been neat to see. We've had a few staff that have left recently because they've gotten their master's degree and they're moving on to more licensed positions. But I think this is just an excellent, uh, excellent position, again, for just building capacity for, for social work or for, for counseling careers. Um, we all know that we need more of those in our, in our community. So some of the basic training that, that our program includes is a behavioral health orientation. Um, we'll talk about a, a CareLink orientation um, and talk about the, the history of the behavioral health homes and the work that we do. Um, all of our CPC uh, care coordinators have been trained in youth mental health first aid. Um, we've also undergone uh, safe zone training and ASAM criteria training. Um, we try to focus on cultural humility quite often. Um, we've got crisis prevention intervention classes, and then um, we'll do a lot of, of um, interdepartmental safety planning and mandated reporting trainings, um, goal setting and care plan uh, trainings, and then, of course, assessment, case consultation, and, and documentation. So um, we do have monthly clinic, or I'm sorry, uh, weekly clinical supervision. And so we try to follow the, the rotating schedule listed here. Uh, once a month, we do do case consultation with our fabulous medical director, Dr. Jaswell. Um, we do offer this to any care coordinator that maybe um, is working with a complex member, or complex family. Um, that wants to help present a present a case for uh, for guidance for resources, um, and so um, we'll offer that once a month. If we don't have any volunteers, then we go down the list so everybody eventually gets the opportunity to present some cases. Um, we also uh, once a, once a month we'll do clinical topics and serving specialized populations populations and Dr. Jaswell has been really amazing in helping us uh, put together trainings or delivering those those trainings and working with uh, specialized populations and we really rely on the care coordinators themselves to to bring to us what um, what information or what training they want so we've had some requests for working with with um, youth with autism spectrum diagnosis uh, or um, DMDD, who I think was a, was a, was an ask a couple of weeks ago. So um, we'll focus on clinical topics. Um, once a month, we like to have uh, somebody from the community come and present information about their agency, uh, both the work that they do and then how we can refer members to them. And again, that kind of feeds into our community engagement plans and is a nice way for us to learn about the agencies in town and then also for them to, to learn about us. Um, and then we will uh, once a month focus on a self-care topic. And so we'll take a look at things like compassion fatigue, provider burnout, stress management, um, because we are a virtual team and everybody's working from home, we'll have topics that include, you know, self-care while you're working from home and um, really just want to make sure that that, that always uh, remains a part of our, our, our conversation. So again, managing a virtual team has been tricky, especially throughout the pandemic. And so just wanted to list out here some of the additional strategies that we um, that we've followed over the last couple of years. Um, again, we really want to empower our team members to participate in program development. And so if the youth that they're working for are all maybe experiencing a certain thing, or if, if one of the care coordinators comes to us with an idea for a possible health promotion group, we really want to take that seriously and really work to help to implement that as quickly as, as we can. Um, we do do our twice weekly um, check-in Zoom meetings. Um, about two years ago, we started doing a gratitude check-in to start every meeting um, that 
did last for about a year and a half. And then finally, um, finally, one of the care coordinators asked if we could um, change the check in question and not not go around and say a gratitude statement at the start of every meeting. But um, it was really a beautiful thing. It was really wonderful to get to hear from every person, every meeting, and whether it was just a check in or, or just a hello. Um, everybody always always has a voice. And so that was that was neat to enforce. Um, we do have a monthly mandatory fun in-person meeting. Um, there's a park that's down the street from our office. And so um, we will meet in a park um, just, to, just to be able to connect. I think the work that the care coordinators do can, can be heavy and can be very intense at times. And, and, and think about bringing that into your living room or in your home office. Um, they can't just look over their shoulder and, and ask for help or say, oh my gosh, this just happened on a call or this just happened with a member. And so we really want to build strong connections amongst the care coordinators that are on the team. Um, so that way they can reach out when, uh, when things get intense or if they need to decompress. I want them to know that they're supported even though we're in a virtual environment and we may not be physically close by. Um, everybody's just a, a tiger text or a phone call or an email away. Um, again, we really worked for uh, preceptor assignments and mentorships for all of our new team members when they join the team. Um, we have a really wonderful Tiger Connect chat and a Microsoft Teams database uh, for resource sharing. And it's really, really neat to see some of the care coordinators type in there. Does anybody know a therapy agency that's accepting a seven-year-old male with no wait list or minimal wait list? And then the number of people that can respond and, and the, the number of options that then that, that come up is really is really quite refreshing because so oftentimes we think that, oh, there's nothing out there, but somehow in some way these, these care coordinators are able to find it. Um, and so then, then really just working to create and foster a, a culture of service um, is, is, is by far one of our, one of our biggest strategies um, for employee engagement. So um, we have really worked to help um, our people participate in some of the hospital-wide activities as well, and so we've had um, we've had employees participate in the Up and Comers Leadership Program, uh, the Mentorship Program. Um, we have a few uh, staff that are trained in the Professional Peer Support Program, and then, uh, like I mentioned, we've most recently been working with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee or Department here at UNMH uh, with their community en engagement team as well. Um, so here's just some pictures. I think this was from Healthcare Workers Appreciation Week, um, and we did have a picnic in the park. It was nice, nice to see everybody in person and in in 3D. And so then this kind of takes us to what's what's next. Um, as we're looking ahead to 2023, we've got some big plans, and we're really excited to continue to refine things and continue to grow. Um, we have now um, some sibling sets that are, that are enrolled in in the um, in the in the child or pediatric care link program. Um, traditionally, if there's been a sibling set, we'll have one care coordinator assigned to work with um, to work with that member. Um, we have also made referrals to the uh, to the adult care link program, and so those those two care coordinators will typically work in tandem. Um, with the family. And so we're looking to pilot more of a family care coordinator role. So that would be just one person that could be assigned to, to working and supporting a, a family. Um, so we look forward to implementing that in 2023. Um, and again, as I mentioned, with Collective Medical increasing their, um, their usability with uh, high utilizer reporting, we're hoping to create more targeted interventions for utilizers of, of emergency and acute services. And so we're looking, uh, again, to be able to, to, to run reports and, and track and follow up with our people in a more targeted way to overall reduce, uh, reduce the un unnecessary utilization of, of those emergency and acute services. Um, We'd also like to work to, to add in the health promotion coordinator position to the UPC CareLink team so that way we can offer some similar classes for our adult members, um, the health education and health promotion classes. Uh, we would really like to strengthen our shared governance chapter. Um, and then we're looking to begin the use of the open beds uh, system to support housing and treatment program search and referral for our members. Um, although we certainly want to avoid the unnecessary utilization of those out-of-home placements, um, sometimes it is necessary and we do look forward to having another tool uh, to helping us to, to manage and, and refer members. 
Um, we like to create more specialized care coordination teams to target individuals with SUD. I think this is this has been something that um, that we're all seeing an increase increased need for. Um, and then we'd like to increase the certified peer support worker team and implement um, some CPSW group services um, in, in 2023 as well. And then um, just continue to align processes, training and clinical supervision schedules between the, the CPC and the UPC care link teams. So um, I will pause here now just for a few minutes to see if there are any questions and I can take a look at the, at the chat here. Um, let me see. Are there any questions? Um, you know, I did have a question, which, you know, I've seen some patients where I've tried to refer them, but I, like their chart would say they had Medicaid but maybe it would be like inpatient only, and then they wouldn't be eligible for CareLink. Could you just explain how, how does that work exactly? Yeah, so so unfortunately, um, the members uh, need to have a full Medicaid, and so um, and so those fee for service or that inpatient outpatient uh, Medicaid does not qualify for our our program here, and so they need to have a, a full Medicaid that is identified through one of the big three, so through like Presbyterian, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, or Western Sky. Um, unfortunately, at this time, we're not we're not able to, to serve the individuals with that pay-for-service Medicaid. Neither. So I will move to kind of our last slide here. This just got our contact information. And so again, you're welcome to, to send referrals or to um, or to reach out with any um, anything that, that, that we can do to help. Um, we've got again our, our email and uh, office phone numbers, our Cerner, Cerner message pool, and then uh, Raylene Riley is our, our fantastic clinical manager. So her contact information is listed in mine there as well. And maybe just because I think I know that it is it accurate that perhaps even if people aren't in Bernalillo County, if we get in contact with you all, they could you can connect them to the proper care link, even if it's not the UNM associated one. We can, and we can, and, 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 you know, some parts of Bernalillo County touch some pretty tricky areas. And so um, we do have the, we do have folks that live in Las Lunas, which is technically Valencia County, but if they're coming up to Bernalillo County, or if they're coming to UNMH for, um, for other services, then we can enroll them into, into our program as well. And so if they're along the edges, we can, we can, um, we can help to justify that. Um, and so, yeah, you're welcome to send over anybody you think that might be interested and we'll we'll really help to get them um, connected either with us or to another care link in 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 the state. Well, thank you so much for this talk, Sarah. I'll just say I can recall maybe in 2018 being in meetings talking about the planning of care link and it, it's just wonderful to see how much success this program has has had and all the, the people that it's helping. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. I, I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to echo that. It's been wonderful working with the team at CareLink. Uh, they're really wanting to help people. So we encourage everybody to refer patients whenever it's appropriate. Thank you for the good presentation. And yeah, just Sarah, just in the chat, there's a lot of appreciation for the wonderful resource that is CareLink and and just really great to tell patients like you refer them and they're really they're gonna hear from someone within a few days and, and get started right away, which unfortunately we can't say for a lot of behavioral health services. So it's wonderful to have something like this. Yeah, thank you. I should mention we do have a little bit of a wait list on the adult side. Um, and so we we do hope to iron that out and get that get that going. Um Hopefully by the first of the year, we'll, we'll be able to, to really just assign people as quickly as they come in. And really, we try to reach out within within four days of, of getting the referral. And so um, we've got about mm, two month wait list on the on the adult team, but pediatric team is still flowing quite nicely. So 
See, I can, I mostly refer pediatric, so I was yep. not aware yep. of the wait list. <laughs> perfect, yeah, perfect. Yeah, great. Just so All right. All right, well, good. Well, thank you, Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> thank Bye. Thank you very much.